Um, hello, good day, and thanks for making time. You are tuned into the issues, your platform of social accountability, with me, Irbad Ibrahim. And today we have a very interesting topic on our table. Um, His Excellency has always had a musing uh, that as a country, it would serve our long-term developmental needs uh, for municipal metropolitan and district chief executives to be directly elected uh, by the people rather than being appointed by the executive arm of government. To help us digest this important issue, I have to my immediate right MP for Atibubo Amantin, Honorable Kofi Amwakohene. Honorable. Thank you so much for making time. Thank you. Back. The BA is a very special area. It has been. Mm -hmm. Good to see you. Good to see you. And too. then we have next to him uh, Mr. Fred Odro, is a governance expert. Sir, thank you so much for making You're time. Welcome. And then we have MP for Garu, uh, Honorable Albert Alazuka Akuga. I love the name, sir. Thank you. Thank you so it's much a, for the king. It is Alazuga Akuka. It's not Alazuga Akuka. Yes. That's a beautiful name. Thank what you. does it mean, Honorable? Uh, thank you. Akuka simply means Teria. Teria. Oh, oh. I see. So you just came after a set of twins. <laughs> exactly. Congratulations. Wow. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, Honorable, I'll start with you. Uh, how do you see the role MMDCs play in a local governance system as a country? Thank you, Ibad. Let me pay regards to our viewers this afternoon, uh, especially to His Excellency, the President of the Republic, Nanado Dago and his economic management team for the good work, and uh, to my constituents. I think uh, it's my pleasure being part of the discussion this afternoon on this subject. MMDC remains the focal direct contact for local governance and since its inception and they've been the direct representation of the government and then they lead the administration disbursements projects in the constituencies so in short i would say that they represent the president mm -hmm. that is the executive like down there and they, they are they have the direct contact with the grassroots okay i believe it's something that we have had a lot of challenges in the discharge of their duties vis-a-vis -vis when it comes to the mps also room mm. because we've messed up the whole things mm. and i think going forward much as we have challenges I think it still remains something that we need to encourage and mm. develop it well, mm. so that especially with the insertion of the election that is coming up, it's on is soon getting to the debate table, okay. and I believe we'll get honourable it in most constituencies like yours, we hear of work between the MP and the DC or the MC, for example. Yeah. Um, are they, you make laws as MPs, are MMDCs and developmental agents you would reckon? Sure, I would do that. But, the, you know, we go directly solicit for power from the people. So in the process, and it's after the election that an MMDC or is elected, or, uh, sorry, appointed. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you went to the people demanded for power for the political party mm -hmm. and they are in government now mm -hmm. then the government appoints the mmc mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so the people know mm -hmm. the mp mm -hmm. and then the mp would have to go and convince them that he is not in charge of development there is something missing there mm -hmm. And the people will say, well, you came to us. <laughs> and when coming, especially in the villages or the small towns, you apply a road to the place. The road was bad. You get there. You needed political leadership for that matter, power. And then they ask you, did you see the road that you apply to the village? Mm. You say yes. Mm. 
when I vote for you, mm. what happens to the road? Mm. Mr. Hibad, you are a security <laughs> expert that I follow for a very long time. Okay. How would you answer such okay. a question? That's a difficult You answer. understand? Fine, we have the power to lobby. Okay. But we don't have the okay. power. We don't okay. have budget okay. to this space. Thank you so much. And Fred Odro, in the UK, um, when you look at various boroughs, you know that the constituents hold the leaders directly accountable for their development. Mm. Is this idea of MMDC is unique to the Republic of Ghana? Well, um, <coughs> it tends to be a characteristic of a characteristic of most unitary systems, particularly those like ours that have come out of um, a lot of. Um, military takeovers and the likes because if you're coming out of a dictatorial systems central governments want to hold on to as much power as they can okay. and it is more common in unitary states than in federal states because whenever you want to practice federalism I mean of necessity you must cede power but the interesting thing is that in even uh, well-developing unitary states, decentralization is something they hold dear, and much more power is given to uh, the subnational governments, like in our case, the assemblies, the districts and the municipalities and the metros tend to be the subnational governments. And we tend to give them as much power as possible, particularly um, when it comes to issues to do with development planning and di direct provision of municipal services, we leave that to the um, local governments for them to take that, uh, to go through that function. But um, um, I never say something that I think we need to go back to our laws. Uh, there are various functions de de delineated for um, chief executives, um, I mean I'm referring to municipal metros and district chief executives. And if you go to the Local Governance Act, um, if you look at section 22B, that encapsulates the functions of the, it says that the district chief executive shall be responsible for the day-to-day -day performance of the executive and administrative functions of the district assembly. I tend to get a bit worried when we look at the chief executive as a representative of um, of the president or, or of the central government. Yes, in essence, that is what is happening. But it goes contrary to the same local governance act. That is, uh, that I mean, the law, the parent act on local government in this country, because. Here is somebody who is there and we deem the person as a representative of a president. In any case, it's the president who appoints him. But then you look at the establishment of the assembly and we say in section four of the local governance act that a district assembly shall be a body corporate with perpetual succession. Okay. Perpetual succession. Yes. How do you set up such a body? And then on of the structure, the executive and political head of that structure is beholden to the president. The president. I mean, it, that, for me, it doesn't gel. And it, it, it goes to the reason why our assemblies are not performing. If we want real accountability, it must be to the people. If we want to have real development, the people who are taxed by law to provide development at the local levels must be accountable to the direct beneficiaries so that they can see that you are doing well or you're not doing well. Okay. And Fred, I'll come back. Honorable, your yes. colleagues have so eloquently explained what the fine lines there are between local assemblies and your role as MPs. Right. Right. Um, do you face the challenge of an MP having become MP on the ticket of party A and then he faces challenges with the local assembly? Do, we, do you have that in your area? Yes, um, thank you very much. Uh, let me say good uh, afternoon to 
um, the people of Garu, if they are watching me, uh, this is Honorable Albert. I think the issue that my colleague uh, mentioned earlier, there is a conflict in, in most of the, you know, between the MPs and then the DCEs, in most uh, assemblies or constituencies. But it is as a result of a, a misunderstanding of, you know, rules. And uh, also because of the during campaign, uh, because you are eager to win your position, people are not able to tell, you know, the electorate the truth, you see. Because in the, the role of the MP is, is mainly to, you know, to, to go to parliament and make laws. You know, there are other, uh, you know, functions you can perform. But your main, your main, your core function as a member of parliament okay. is enactment of laws. Okay. Um, other subsidiary, uh, you know, functions that you can perform, uh, you know, helping or facilitating development in your constituency is not the main one. You can lobby from uh, other uh, development partners or maybe government or ministries to bring development to, but that's not your main function. Mm -hmm. But because we are underdeveloped, we are underdeveloped as a country, there are so many, uh, you know, basic necessities that are lacking in, in society. And the people's, uh, you know, what they need, their immediate need is about bread and butter, it's about major, uh, you know, uh, uh, basic infrastructural like sc schools, like hospitals, like roads, and, and those kind of things. When you go, the issue, it doesn't make it, telling them that you are going to represent them in parliament and make laws doesn't make sense to them. You know, so they want to hear what you can do to, you know, to improve upon their condition when you are in parliament. And so sometimes uh, during campaign, politicians are forced to say things that they know too well that it's not their main, uh, you know, their core function, as my, my colleague just uh, rightly made. Now, you, you come back, uh, you go to parliament, you come back, the 95% or 95.5% of the, the, the common fund or the resources that comes to a district goes to a district assembly for development. 4.5% is what they give you maybe in case of some, uh, you know, uh, immediate or some agent issues that as you walk around, you can take care of them while you wait on assembly. That five, that less than five percent, cannot turn around the development uh, needs of the area. But because you are the face during the election, during campaign, the people sometimes do, uh, do, do not even know that the resources are with the district executive or the assembly, and so they are looking up to you. And sometimes they even think that the MP has so much authority over the DC said that he can just go and order him or her you know, to, 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 to do what, but like we are see, we are, my colleagues mentioned, yeah. the DC is directly represent the president, because the president doesn't control the member of parliament, whether he is uh, a, a member of the ruling uh, government or party. not, because he is elected by the people to represent them in parliament, to be their voice in parliament, and for that matter, the president doesn't control, but because the president has, uh, you know, nominated somebody and say, okay, you go there and be my voice or be my face on the ground. Directly, the president can either, uh, he can determine whether you can stay there or not. Okay. And so, because out of fear, the district executives mostly are, you know, I mean, they are so uh, vulnerable that whatever orders that come from, whether regional minister or minister for local government or the presidency, you have to, whether you can do it or not, you have to answer, yes. Okay. And, and, and so, um, to answer the question whether the, the, the issue of conflict, you go back to the constituency, the, the DCC executive uh, is in charge, the people don't know that, and then they are looking up to you, so you have to go to the DCC executive to ask him to do A or B, okay. you know. And he doesn't think that you have that authority. Okay. So you find yourself fighting with the okay. issue of uh, We'll uh, soon scrutinize. And some of them also are, are in your seat. 
and so hmm. they want to frustrate you. Okay. So this we'll, is we'll, we'll soon scrutinize the vision of His Excellency to have MMDCs elected. But Honorable, I'll come back to you. Some see the position of the Chief Executive in every assembly as a conciliatory position. Chances are during the primaries, which are an internal election for MP, mm -hmm. the runner-up is appointed by the president to become the DC, mm -hmm. and therefore, as you are in Accra legislating, the person is sabotaging you back home. Don't you see political parties have a responsibility uh, to clear the air so that such conflicts Honorable has, you know, referred to do not bedevil the activities of both authorities? Sure. I think uh, for the first time, the conflict between the MMCECs and the MPs brought the first government to disrepute, and then uh, President Kufo's time, and then President uh, Arrows referring to President Rollins as its time. There was that conflict, and then it migrated to affect NPV. When President Kufo came, that was the cause. So I think uh, this government has almost tried to address that then because I've seen a secular to the, all the MMCs and DCs that the government says that if you are interested to contest any MP, you should resign your post three years. And I think uh, His Excellency President Kufuado in this angle has addressed that issue because he's seen that it has been uh, an issue that continued to affect uh, change of government and for that matter, you know, our context, we would need a democracy that would at least sustain for, if I say tenure in this context, that's eight years, maybe 16 years with good vision so that we can execute a lot of change, transformation agendas for this nation to at least get to uh, a little close to the uh, emerging world like the China and the Singapore's and the Indies. Okay, so back to the question, that has been an issue and I believe going forward, I know the NDC as the main opposition party has also seen that because it was news items every now and then, in the north, in the south, in the west, in the east, MMDCs and the MPs, that conflict. But I think we need to educate them, all of us, our roles. Because even some MPs also think that I am the MP I was voted for, so anything I tell the MMDC. By going through and the submission that Fred Mr. Fred made, mm -hmm. you could see it clear. They have their functions and they operate. Mm -hmm. So I personally advise my friends and colleagues that, look, uh, you may be the MP5, but he also has an office operating fully as a man or female of himself. Okay. You understand? So it's better we strike partnership deal with them, with dialogue, and then like an instance that my brother, mm. Honorable, made, so that they know that, okay, you are here, I am here. What are we doing? What are your plans, programs? Let me know. Okay. So that when I go around, I could use them also to respond to the need of the people. Okay. After all, we are all in one ship. Okay. And when we sing, we sing together. Okay. When we float, we float together. Okay. Mr. Fred Odro, in all courtesy, I'll skip you, go to Honorable briefly and then come back. Yeah. Honorable, he says it's an admitted challenge you have as MPs right. and then, you know, MD, MMDCs. Right. He has explained to us what his party is doing to curtail that challenge. From where you sit, it's common for an MP to say the DC is making my work difficult. But the DC is saying the MP is making my work difficult. Yeah. As we look at the expert view, in your case, what is your party doing to, um, you know, kind of salvage the situation? Yeah, uh, th thank you very much. Um, it is, I'm sure the, the party uh, has, you know, experienced this in the past. Uh, and steps are being taken to, you know, also right some of these uh, challenges. Uh, I'm very sure that uh, from where they have. In the past, it, they have always said so, 
except that maybe they haven't come up with a directive like they have done. So going forward, maybe after the, our national executive elections, I'm sure some kind of decisions will be taken. But unfortunately for us, we are in opposition. We don't have DCs, <laughs> so, so <laughs> we may not have that challenge now. Uh, but I think uh, it, is, it, is, it is something that is actually uh, important for political parties to tackle if they really want to have the harmony, the peace, and you know the, the, the unity that we need to be able to okay. you know you know, know, know work uh, okay. for power. Okay. So so, so it is it's really a challenge. Okay. Yes. Uh, Fred, from an expert point of view, uh, how do you think the fine gentlemen on the table can propose to their parties to tackle this challenge? Well, I, I would actually want to even go beyond the political parties because there's a real challenge between. MPs and district, uh, district chief executives because even if you are it's your, you are in the ruling party, they could be targeting you. Well, the DC could target people whether they are in their party or in the opposition. So it's a common problem that MPs are facing, and it stems from a provision in our law. Again, we, if you go back to the Local Governance Act, it, it says in a. Um, if you go to uh, section 25, it says a district chief executive shall hold office for four years, but the district chief executive shall not hold office for more than two consecutive terms. So, if you take somebody who is, for status, the president is an appointee of a president. So, if a president gets up one day and doesn't like your fees, he can even suck you. And that even if you do so well, no matter how well you do, after eight years maximum, two consecutive terms, you are out. And people want to, I mean, people go into politics, and they want, some can stay in politics for 40 years thereabouts. I mean, there are, uh, there, there, there are senators and people as well who've been in, um, in the Senate in, or the House yeah, of in the Parliament, Representatives, in Congress in general. In Congress thing. particularly. I mean, even if you go to UK, you have people who have sat in the House of Commons for, for, for so many years. So um, people want some kind of security. And so they will target you. So that leads us into question, why have we decided to make the role, the, the district chief executive's position, appointed and then why have we put a term limit to it so it doesn't matter how well the person is even performing however you go to the MP's position I mean unless you lose an election or you think I'm fed up I won't contest again you can be there for as long as your health can permit and your people permit so these are some of the critical institutional things or legal problems that we face that if we really want to remove that kind of um, sometimes what I consider to be unnecessary uh, competition between the chief executives and the MPs, we need to, for instance, remove the time limits that we impose on the chief executives so that those who are even performing well can continue to be there. If I have a, a mayor or chief executive who is doing well and they are going to be there for 30 years, what's the problem? Okay, and uh, I will, uh, you know, um, I'll prick your mind briefly on this before I go to Honorable to explain the vision of the President yeah. so we get to the meat of the discussion. What remedies are available to the President? Is it that it was only a campaign or manifesto promise that MMDCs would be elected by this year or that year, so through an executive order he can get that done, or there are some procedural hurdles he may face as the first gentleman and commander in chief? Yes, um, there are a lot of hurdles, serious hurdles, because um, first, the president is not just seeking to let us elect directly our district chief executives by seeking to do so on partisan basis. Mm. We are going beyond, you see, our local government system as we have it now is supposed to be non-partisan. So you can't conduct any election on partisan basis. But the president wants to take the boldest possible step, I think, I've ever seen under our, uh, uh, since independence, to get us to elect our um, 
chief executives on a partisan basis. And let me state that that is the position I fully support. Incidentally, I mean, we know that this constitution was made under President Rawlings. I mean, he shepherded the constitution from Chairman Rawlings into President Rawlings. And by and large, it was his political viewpoint that prevailed non-partisan local government system. The funny thing is that it is only for two years before, after, since our independence, we've practiced partisan local government system for only two years. The 1960 Republican Constitution removed everything partisan of our local government system. Because then Ghana was virtually heading towards a, a one-party state. Yeah. So we, we have, since that time till date, we've never had a local government system which is partisan. But So I get a bit worried. When people want to cite difficulties that nobody has proven to me that, oh, we have this problem oh, in our political history. Now Ghana is how many years? 61 years. So if you take out about two years, when we were even babies, we were baby as a country, that we started a partisan local government system. Until now, the fact is that our local government system has failed to live up to expectation. But the, it holds the potential to turn around the development of this country. But because we have said we don't want a partisan system. That's the difficulty we, we have. So there are two hurdles the president faces. Because he wants a partisan system, in our constitution we have what we call an entrenched clauses. And then we have non-entrenched clauses. Some of the clauses that we need to amend, for instance, um, if, you, if you take um, Article 356D, which is on decentralization. It talks about a local government system. It says political parties can participate in everything, any political activities, except at the local level. And this is an entrenched clause. And to amend that process, it's a, I mean, we can go through the process. It's very, very tedious process. Then if you come into, there are various sections under chapter 20 of the constitution that deals with local government and decentralization. Those ones are not entrenched. So if you want to amend those ones, it is easy. I mean, like, uh, for instance, the election of, uh, the selection of um, uh, chief executives is through appointment. And then there must be approval process in the assembly. That one is a non-entrenched provision in the constitution. So those ones, you can easily use Parliament to amend it. But even that is not just a simple process. But if you go to the entrenched clauses, that is where the pro problems begin. So I think to succeed in this, we need to have our political parties, particularly the two major parties, agreeing to support the process. Otherwise, I don't think it will. Yes feasible. or no, before I go to another, do you think this could lead to a filibuster in Parliament where there is no consensus from the minority? Well, um, it's a very high possibility because both parties in reality don't want it. Honorable, mm -hmm. this is the baby of His Excellency, your boss, yes, and sir. currently our, our president generally. Could you, you tell us what is running through the head of His Excellency that he would want this thing done? What is his vision and why? Well, it was stated clearly in our manifesto. And actually, it wasn't the first time. And I think it's been tackled also in an MDC manifesto. And then PPP, uh, in 2016 election, it was one of the things that he also highlighted. But let's deal with the fact here. It's something that is going to help the nation to let the local assemblies find their ratio and to be able to discharge effectively their duties. And also to bring governance as it ought to be.
to the people, the grassroots. But what we've all been lacking from the previous leadership is the political boldness to implement. And I think it's been a debate, even internally, if I say internally, from colleagues' point of view, people think, A. Hey, <laughs> this thing, president should look at it well, well for what? For me. I personally, as an individual, I stand for it. People are asking, well, what about an NDC or because they are the major po uh, uh, political opposition, opposition party? party. One, well, it's easy for people to just say, what about NDC dominated area? An honorable seated here belongs to an NDC. It's an NDC party, may I repeat. And I'm for MPP. What happens? We are still working in the parliament. You understand? If we know that this is what is going to help the nation, why don't we do it? Because, one, it is going to make their individuals accountable to the people. And for that matter, they are going to be benefited, the people, directly from their responsiveness to their duty. You understand? So for me, as an individual, I am all for it. Because if we are talking about conflicts between MMCs, MMDCs, and the MPs, why? Because the MPs go to the people, solicitors for the party's vote. Afterwards, they would have direct contact with the people, and they must be accountable to the people directly. So there have been an instance that an electorate could walk to an MC or a DC or whatever and uh, for a discussion. Mm. And the DC will be bold enough to tell you as it is. Mm. But in the case of an MP, you need to decorate it mm. and do a good presentation. Why? Because your power is directly mm. connected to that electorate. You understand? So I think it's rather going to make uh, the people also uh, responsive to the, the power block <laughs> and, 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 and the electorate mm. who gives the power. Yeah. And if they are doing that mm. and, and MPs happens, quote unquote, to be the best managers of the people, mm. why? Mm. Because our source of power is directly connected to the people. So if the MMDCs and then others are also being voted for, mm. then they would also have that mm. click. And then some, we know mm. that if we conduct research by behavior of MMDCs and MPs, you would find out that a lot of MPs are humble. Not humble in nature, but by their portfolio. Because the people can easily tell, yeah, I call you, didn't pay you. When it's an election time, you come around. But you can't tell uh, this. Sometimes you can't even go to him. Mm. Why? Because uh, his source of power does not come from you. Even though you can criticize, you can demonstrate. And uh, when you have a president who happens to like somebody, mm. <laughs> you understand, mm. you can go to any level and the person will still be there. Okay. But if it's an elective, then I think okay. we'll be moving know. forward. What is the position of your political party and your side of the aisle in Parliament on this issue? Is it that you agree to it, but you think uh, there needs to be consensus on the methodology, or you poo-poo it completely? Well, thank you very much. Um, let, let me say that uh, the, the, the idea of electing uh, MMDC is is a laudable one for, for a number of reasons. One of the, the reasons is maybe to, it will help minimize the conflict that uh, we all you know, spoke of. And then secondly, it will, it will make the, the MMD, because remember when you are to go around and campaign and convince people to you know, vote you, you will make some statements. You see, so, so, so you will feel accountable directly to them. And so even the, the first proposal that uh, the, the president nominates uh, about five people or so, but the, you know, there was some recommendation that was done during our time, 
we the constitutional review yes, the, 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 the white that's paper that's exactly the white paper that was the recommendation um so so for my party yes we even spoke about it first and they went ahead to let i mean the thing reflected in the constitutional review uh, committee's uh, presentation so so yes our party my party is for it okay uh, maybe it might be a bit different from what uh, our sitting president is uh, proposing that we should make it political i don't know what if i'm right am i right that's what you are yeah, he says it's still it's on discussion it's table so when it comes to right. us yeah. there's no relationship so, so i think no, what, what is on offer being championed by mm -hmm. the ministry of local government right. is a partisan uh, okay. election that's okay so so uh, it will for me i i'm for it and i think my my party is for it as i said we even were the first to come up with the idea and so why are we why 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 not for it and so it will go a long way to make the DCs accountable. It will, it will reduce the friction between DCs and MDCs because it will also make them, uh, you know, a bit more focused on issues about development. Uh, because of the fact that, uh, like my colleague said, you, are, you got your power from uh, the president. L by and large, they, they, they think that someone else has given me the power. But you see, if you are really a responsible DC chief executive, you are the face of the president in the, your district. And for that matter, you, and you're, except your president doesn't want to come up to power. Because you are his face because you are supposed to market him and market the party at your district. Uh, so, so if you don't work well, if you are not accountable to the people, if you are not development oriented, it means that you are indirectly pulling your party down. You see, so, but there are few uh, irresponsible ones who might think that, oh, I've been given power, and so let me, you know, lord over the people. And, 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 and the results normally will come, uh, will show at the end. Okay, Honorable, I'll yeah. stay with you before I go to uh, Fred. Um, one thing that undergirds such a robust move by His Excellency and also political leaders like you is the issue of partisanship. The former president, Prof. Mills, uh, felt development sh should be a continuum, and therefore when he came to power in 2009, he maintained yeah. some of the chief executives, much yeah. to the chagrin yeah. of party members. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Was he oversimplistic in tackling the local government issues we have? Yeah, thank you very much. You see, Prof. was an idealist. You know, I mean, he, the way he tackled things, what he was, he, that's the ideal thing to do. But you see, where we come from uh, in this part of the world, um, it is very difficult for, for you to succeed with that. What was the results of um, when he tried doing that? Because it's like there, there a few of the opposition then saw the good thing in it. But some took advantage of that, you see. And, 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 and therefore, um, destroyed records and did whatever you know to try to cover. Prof wanted a unified system. It was a, it's, it's a, it was a very good start. If all other political parties would be less vindictive, you know, Prof wanted to unify Ghana. But when we, uh, we uh, he left, and then the next part, what did, what didn't we see? You see, you come in and you want to you know pick an axe after uh, previous appointees. You see, because you know too well that when um, he allowed the DG executive to stay on for some time, if you didn't know that your party was going to lose, now your party has lost, you will take time to clean your table and make everything perfect before you exit. You see. Now, uh, in our case, your party loses the next day, leave. Even, I'm sure maybe there was something, your hand over nose is not even prepared, nothing, you leave. There was probably some things you left halfway hanging. Mm -hmm. uh, they will come and hang on that mm -hmm. and punch mm -hmm. the mistakes of your political party mm -hmm. and all that. You mm -hmm. see, that is where you see that some of things like what Prof did mm -hmm. is not sustainable. I mean, it is, it's not uh, it's going to wash. Mm -hmm. Because next time somebody comes, do you think they will, rep they will repeat the same thing? <coughs> so a lot of us in our party thought that what he did affected us as a party. And so I don't think that they will want to make such a mistake. Fred. I'm sourcing this from one of the online portals in Ghana. And the story came 
only five days after the swearing in of his excellency the current president he was sworn in on the 7th of january and this came on the 12th of january only five days after that mm. his excellency rana kufuado asks all mmdces mm. to hand over yes so I have, um, I, I don't like the politics. No, no, because, no I'm, I'm, I'm no, asking no, the question. I, we have to I, I, want, I want to, I, I want let to, to, let to just to shift this in. Mm. We have to be fair to His Excellency, the current president. Mm -hmm. Honorable admits that Prof. Mills as a president was an idealist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe His Excellency Leonardo wants to be a realist that I can't work with the NDC because yeah, I came to power on the ticket of the MPP and I need my own people to work and have results. I, uh, incidentally, I am quite skeptical of politicians a, a lot. Le let's not forget certain backgrounds. Let's go back to 2001 when President Kufo took power. How long did it take him before he asked? the okay. chief executives to hand over it was more than 30 days how long did it take prof mills but then even that i wanted us to look at the circumstance in 2009 there was a runoff in fact there was even the um uh, the time uh -huh. election so it was prof mills it was nearly let's say about seven days for him to prepare to take over after the um, the second round election and but then the still, time uh, I uh, 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 it wasn't clear that maybe uh, a particular party uh, uh, I can, uh, I, I can so attest to the fact that this is one area I won't talk about economics yeah. if you want to bring in economics but this is my area and I know what I'm talking about you see the time for you to even take over in, imposes certain limitation on it. the last election I mean, even with all the delay, by the 10th of January, uh, December, we knew who was the president, uh, I mean, who had won the last election. So every chief executive, district chief executive, had at least one whole month knowing that my party had lost election, and no matter what, I'm going to leave office. So if you tell me that you're a chief executive whose party has lost election, and you tell me that within the uh, one month period, you couldn't prepare your handing over. What were you about? I'm not bothered about some of these things. Because all the political parties are, are guilty of these things. They are all vindictive. When they come in, they remove their political opponents. It's as simple as that. No political party is a saint in this country. And the most people were removed from office. Under President Kufu, the people have been removed from office. Under President Kufu, people were removed from office. So I don't want politicians to school me that, oh, we were better. None of them are better. Okay. All of them are guilty of the same thing. Oh, I am free. But free. There, there, there's, there's a significant issue that I need to bring about. Okay. You see, when it comes to election of MMDCs, the promise, in the run-up to the 2000 elections, it was a pledge by President Kufo that he was going to do it. And he didn't do it. In the run-up to the 2008 election, during the IEA debate between um, Nana Kufadu, uh, uh, Prof. Mills, uh, Dr. Papa Kwesindium, then representing the CPP, and then uh, Dr. Um, um, the PNC, the, Dr. Edward Mahama, they all pledged that they would see to the election of the district chief executives and when prof mills was in power we set up this constitutional review commission and the commission came out with a clear issue that the country wants to elect its own district chief executives in the run up to the 20, 2012 election president mahama who had taken over issued a white paper on the crc reports and then different scenarios were projected we will present five people to the uh, public services commission for them to uh, um, they will go through a screening exercise three will be presented uh, to the assembly members for them to elect and this is not what Ghanaians want 
I know I, I've had chats. I know the, the currently the the NCC has got a report that also affirms the fact that a majority of about over sixty percent of Ghanaians want elected district chief executives. Yeah, but honourable, hmm. um, yeah. there seems to be a deadlock uh, because we all want to solve the issue of excessive partisanship in this country very, very so maybe as a young Ghanaian in my district and I want to be the DC for the area you are saying it's going to be thoroughly partisan I have to run on the ticket of the MPP or the NDC no you can also you can also go independent because we've had independent members how many of independents you no, do, you see, you see, have won in uh, any uh, election um, in Ghana let, let Let's, so it let's means we are we are decentralizing the partisanship on the top, even to the grassroots level. We going to if we do that, we are going to have better power sharing in this country. You see, we are, are we are too exclusive. We are not having political inclusion because let me give you one instance. Honorable contests for MP in his area and then he loses i mean but his party wins the election meaning that his the, the party the people of the area has clearly rejected him as a person to lead them but because his party wins the election what happens maybe the opposition party member is in parliament but then the president appoints him so when we are talking about if I am not going to use the word that I'm so much in love with, these days I'm not too keen about accountability. But I'm looking at responsiveness. I'm not going to use that word. Mm -hmm. How responsive are our districts or our assemblies to our people? Mm -hmm. I mean, there was a, a, a case, I mean, it's a common case. People are refusing to pay taxes to assemblies because... The problem is that they don't see the assemblies being responsive to their needs. They think the assemblies take the money and they use it for their own benefit rather than to their, the benefit of the people. So I am saying that if we want inclusive governance, if the people decide that, yes, you are the president, we voted for you nationally, but then in this area, this individual, we prefer this individual to be our chief executive. What's the problem? And let me add, we see we are playing ostrich here in this country. Okay. If you take the local assembly elections, the district uh, level elections that we hold, whenever it's time, you just take a walk around time, look at the posters. The posters people are using will even tell you the parties they belong to. Mm -hmm. And the parties are meeting to decide who should contest on their behalf in various places at the assembly level. So we are playing ostrich here, behaving as if the, 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 the district assembly election is non-partisan. It is very partisan, only that we are just pretending we don't know. Uh, so so I think we should face to the, up to the realities and allow people. And I believe that if there are individuals who don't want to join any political parties and they are very good, the communities will know that this man is a resourceful person. And they vote for them. Thank you. Honorable. For independent observers like us, if someone is even a cobbler, the person makes shoes and polishes them. After four or eight years of doing that, the person would have had some expertise in it. Why should partisanship cause us to relegate people? Like, as we speak, we've mobilized only 50% of the human resources of this country. The remaining 50% have gone on standby, waiting to say that you fail, mm -hmm. so that they take over the mantle of leadership. Uh, could His Excellency not have chipped in something that would have been more unifying, like deepening the partisanship and devolving it even to the local level? Excellent. I think all this discussion, all that the president is doing has not come to light as we speak, as members of parliament. And then we would have option as people's representation to input whatever draft that will be presented before us. So I think what is needful is what the president has been able to do. Now, let's go. 
Honorable uh, my friend, friend, uh, friend. Uncle Fred said something that I'd wanted also to touch on it. You go to our constituencies or in the district and at the assemblyman election, as he said, every single one you could easily. So I've been a politician for a very long time. We influence most of their votes and other things. So why would we as people not say, fine, it is MPP today. Yes, but let the people have choices, if even it's MPP. And let them go. Because even the assemblyman elections are not even attractive. You go to some if you uh, take analogy of the results so far being produced, and then liken it to the parliamentary oh, turnout is very low. Very, very low. And it's unattractive. You understand? So the representation that we are uh, envisaged will not be achieved in the first place. Hmm. So for me, we need also to look at that. Fine. We know. I know Honorable is an NDC. I know myself as an MPP. Fine. Governance is our political party. Hmm. Now we are here. Hmm. Okay. Let's face the fact, the reality. Hmm. This thing, we want, to, we want it to be an elective position. Hmm. Sure. But I am ruling. Before I could appoint for you. Hmm. Now, this is my party. Hmm. We have MP or we don't have by your choice. Hmm. Now we have these three men, hmm. six men, ten men. From this side, let's go for it. Hmm. Oh, the same thing as we did uh, to the MPs. Three from here, three from here. <laughs> Let them come, let them contest with the political colors. Then let's see if the people would one time say that for MMDC we want Mr. A, but for MP we want Mr. B. Honorable. And gradually we'll go from there. Sorry, we've exhausted all our time, so I'll give everybody a word. But Honorable, I'll give you two minutes okay. because you couldn't right. you know, speak. Thank you very much. Two let me quickly uh, say that. Um, the aspect uh, that our uh, brother, our uncle, just mentioned, he, he spoke of the possibility of maybe somebody, uh, maybe somebody who is uh, liked by the people from a particular constituency or district going independent. You see, the Ghanaian, uh, our, our, the, we are not well sensitized. In terms of the, the, the democracy hasn't gone that deep to the point that people can be able to understand that somebody can go independent and be able to perform. Because right now, in Ghana, if you ask anybody, they know of MPP and DC. Mm. Even the other, the other political parties, there are good materials there. Go and contest for any election. You are very good material for parliament. Go and stand on independent or anything and see if you can make it. He's a governance aspect with a lot of knowledge in that area, which I know he, he is needed in parliament. Let him go and stand independent in his constituency and see what he will get. You see, so, so the issue is that the fear of, you know, wasting your time and resources and losing is what normally makes a lot of people, you know, shy away from, uh, you know, uh, projecting themselves on a non-partisan line. So for me, if we want to go partisan, we have to go partisan. And the partisanship it will just, you know, kill a lot of potentials who are not, you know, aligned to any political party. Uh, to sum up, I think the the idea of you know electing DCs is, is a very laudable one. We should uh, encourage it. We should all encourage the president to let to let this happen okay. in Ghana. My only concern is that um, it is going to be another you know uh, a, a promise and fail. It will not happen in Ghana because presidents will always want to have control of what is happening there. And because there is very, f it's not easy. It's not they are not. He's not likely to let somebody with in, uh, of independent mind oh, no, thinking but. that he represents. Oh, no, but then we need another show <laughs> because you just shut down all the things <laughs> that said. You said it won't happen. <laughs> I thought you said there was no, consensus. No, it is, it is, it, no, it is my, you know, I said it. I said that it is a good thing. It is a good. But you say it won't happen. No, it is. It will. You know, the, from the political point of view, that is what I'm looking at. Okay. So, so uh, we are not just. Uh, they are very nice uh, ideas. All what we are espousing here, okay. all the suggestions we are making okay. here, is the best for okay. for Ghana. Okay. But 
knowing where the promise is coming from. I know it won't happen. That is just <laughs> Fred, in 30 seconds, if you may, I'm sorry. honorable in 30 seconds. I think we if we are able to do it, it will help yeah. improve political inclusiveness. Taking away the winner takes all mentality in our politics. What goes a long way even to reduce the security stress on our politics. I also think that it will, if we are electing our district chief executives, they will be more responsive and they can also take on central government because even as we speak over the years, central governments are not sending the requisite five percent demanded from the uh, common fund to the assemblies. Sometimes we've had situations that government have said we will pass the this year in 2015 it happened in this country government failed to pay uh, district assembly common fund and nobody could say anything mm -hmm. but if we had if people who are elected they could even take central governments to court and insist that okay they're given okay thank you so much fred honorable uh, you take us home it's a good thing and i believe we have to comment the second to the president of the republic and other than Kufado, for having the boldness to do it and I would end by assuring my uh, honorable MP that the fact that they have brought to a habitation point does not mean that there is no other world. His Excellency Namadou is going to do it for Ghana to be the benefactor. Uh, uh, we, uh, we didn't have any politicians. <laughs> Thank you so much. We have in the studios MP for uh, Antibu uh, uh, Honorable uh, Kofi no, it's, it's Amon Kofi. Kofi. No, Honorable, thank you so much for making time. <laughs> And then we also had the governance expert Fred Oduro. <laughs> Uncle, thanks yeah. for making time. And MP for Garu, uh, Honorable Albert Alazuka Afuka. Thank you. Yeah. That's a very beautiful <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> Thank you so yeah. much. Uh, um, this show is um, ably produced by the director, Akwesin Chi, and supported by a dedicated crew, Eunice Robert, Joseph Badu, Francis Ajokum, Freeman Selassie, uh, Achina Britio and Abigail Deku. So we come your way next week with another edition of the issues. Stay blessed and keep watching GTV. Have a good day.